Welcome to Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom, where wisdom comes from everywhere. This is a podcast about generational wisdom shared to help build a bridge for future generations and to build stronger communities through education, technology, and health. Welcome to Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom. Hola, hola, mi gente. Welcome to Summer. It is the end of July. We're heading into August. It's summertime. And what's the one thing we all like to do in the summer? I know as a kid, I used to like to go to the movies a lot and to the mall with my friends. Why? Because it was nice and cool. And in the Central Valley, it's really hot. So that was a reprieve for a lot of us to go and enjoy some quality time. And I love the movies in the summertime, especially at night as well. That was fun. Going to the drive-in. Do you remember the drive-in? I want those to come back. Okay, so why are we talking about the film industry today? Well, there's a writer strike going on, and that's really important to the future of movie making and content writers, and also how these movies and content will be distributed. You know, streaming platforms have really come into a powerhouse of economic viability because of COVID. It's really flipped the script on going out to the movies and also how they're produced. So streaming platforms today are really taking a dent into the box office and inquiring minds like myself want to know why streaming platforms are becoming so popular, especially now since we've gone to the movies, but in COVID, we were able to search for the things that we wanted to see in our own homes, right? Finding our own voices and taking a look into how we can find more of that content through streaming platforms. Just recently, when Flaming Hot came out by Eva Longoria and, you know, when we saw Encanto and Coco and all these wonderful movies that made an impact on our representation, we are thriving and wanting more. So everybody get ready for Blue Beetle that's going to come out in a few weeks. That's our first Latino represented comic book movie, Blue Beetle, from DC Comics. Okay, but my guest today who's going to talk a little bit about the movie industry and our Latino voices in the Chicano community. His name is Johnny Murillo, founder of Chicano Hollywood. And Chicano Hollywood is the first media company dedicated to elevating, entertaining, and empowering the large population of the Mexican-American and Latino English-speaking community that identifies Chicanos or with the Chicano culture. So they want to unite the Chicano creators with a Chicano audience to establish a platform that they believe our stories have to be told by our own voice and representing us so we can be unified in a stronger narrative. So let's welcome Johnny Murillo from Chicano Hollywood to Latinas from the block to the boardroom. All right, Johnny, very excited to have you here. And I just want folks to know that Latinas from the block to the boardroom, we invite everyone to be on this show. I know it specifically says Latinas, but as I've said in my other podcasts, there's reasons for that around the search criteria. You can catch episode 42 if you want to know more about that. But I have Johnny Murillo here from Chicano Hollywood. If you do not know Chicano Hollywood, you do now. It is a platform just like Latinas, but this is to showcase Chicanos and Latinos making films and doing media. So, Johnny, thank you for being with me today. Yes. First, thanks for having me. I'm excited. I've been looking forward to this. And you're right. I'm not a Latina, but I'm in support of all Latinas, you know, so. Gracias. Gracias. I know you have both of us, a male and female on there. So, (laughs) Um, yeah, let me tell you the story. It's kind of fun. Because this is one of those, it kind of wasn't intentional in a sense, like, like I have this business idea was it just, this kind of evolved. So I've been here in Hollywood now for going on 15 years. First part of my career life, I was a pastor in the last church we were pastoring. I was in Sacramento. And then, you know, long story short, my kids got scouted at an event. So we started kind of plugging in. We were bringing them to auditions and so on. So we're kind of plugging into the Hollywood scene. And then, you know, after um, the 2008 crash, which really affected Northern California with the real estate and all that, a series of other events happened that we just had to close our church. So 
in all that time, in all that, you know, calamity and chaos that was going on with, with the economy and with, uh, with our church closing. And then of course we lost our house. A lot of unfortunate things happened that kind of pushed us into Hollywood. And so, so we just took the, the risk and really feeling like this was, you know, part of our mission and our calling as well. We took the risk and said, all right, let's go to Hollywood. You know, by this time, my son, my oldest went to college. He was in Orange County in college. And then I had my two daughters. So we moved down here to Culver City 15 years ago. And we we're like, what do we do here now? You know? And so I had some experience acting. So I was, you know, doing some acting. I was, uh, getting involved that way. I, I took some classes at UCLA to kind of learn the business side of it. Thank God, you know, I partnered with a couple of buddies and we just kind of became a little crew and we didn't you know doors started opening. So we're doing like behind the scenes for some hip hop artists. Like there's one named um, Red Foo from LMFAO. We were doing all his BTS and touring with him. And then things just kind of evolved. And so last 15 years, you know, I've done content for like BuzzFeed, Battle Like, uh, Me Too, Snapchat, I've done some food series. So I'm kind of building my chops when it comes to production, right? Writing as well, you know, produce a couple movies. And then about two years ago, right when the pandemic was kind of, we're coming out of it, you know, 2021, a buddy of mine kind of sent me just a one patron. He said, Hey, can you turn this into a script? And it was just some bunch of ideas on one page. And I said, yeah, you know, I kind of have an idea. So I flipped it to a feature film script. And, uh, and then we produced it. So it's called Orchata with Oat Milk. It's a comedy, you know, it's a, it's basically a story about gentrification. You know, a guy comes out of prison 20 years later, goes back to his old barrio. And then what used to be a gang infested barrio has now been uh, gentrified. So the old taco stand is now a cupcake place, you know, stuff like that. So there's a lot of comedy involved, right? Homeboy came out looking for his old gang too, and they're all dispersed. So <laughs> It was, it's funny, you know, and we had some great talent. We had like Jerry Garcia, who was the lead. We had Dunos. These are comedians, Chicano comedians. We had Concrete. We had uh, uh, Jay Valentino and a bunch of others. And so that particular production, this is how the name came out. Now, it's kind of funny. We were doing a dialogue and basically, you know, I write the script, but I wrote it, you know, my Cholo days are from the 80s, right? So my slang different, right? And so we had to have a dialogue meeting with some of these younger guys and say, so, okay, and I would tell them, okay, I said this, what, how would you say it? So we're just kind of getting some dialogue tweaks in there, but I had the script projected up on the wall and the director, he, uh, his name's LB, he's standing in front of me smoking a joint and he just does this big puff of smoke. And I'm looking at that, I'm like, wow, that's a cool picture because it has a big a script right there, or chato to milk and the big thing of smoke. And I'm like, hey, bro, do it again, do it again. He said, well, I said, I won't take that picture. Do it again. I made him do it like six or seven times. He was dying. I'm right, all right, I'm all right. I said, well, give me a big one. You know, so I finally got the shot, you know, and I sent that to my daughter. My daughter at this time was a senior at Azusa Film School. And I sent her that picture and I said, hey, check this out. I'm with Chicano Hollywood. Just a joke. A bunch of Chicanos doing a dialogue meeting and, you know, up on the wall. So it's just a joke. So then I nicknamed that whole production Chicano Hollywood just for fun. So like on set, whenever something good would happen, we'd high five each other. Say, all right, we're Chicano Hollywood. And I noticed how, you know, we had Chicanos in front of the camera and Chicanos behind the camera. And Chicanos are Mexican-American, but there's, this is Chicano culture too, because we had Salvadorans, we had Guatemalan. You know, we're all raised in the same barrios, right? So Chicano culture. So I would just nickname them Chicano Hollywood. I'd tell my wife, like, hey, I've got to meet with Chicano Hollywood. And, you know, then my daughter, they knew what it was. And. As we were going, I saw how they were just gravitating towards the name and how they were taking pride in the name. And then one day the uh, makeup artist, she shows up with some hoodies that said Chicano Hollywood really big, but, or Chato Adult Milk smaller, right? And I'm looking at that like, wow, you know, this is, this is something here. So when I saw those, you meet me, I'm like, okay, I got the socials. I got the domains. I started the trademark and we just, let's see where this goes, you know? But Chicanos, are, we're 40 million Mexican-Americans in the U.S., plus another 10 that are Guatemalan, Salvadorian, that are the same voice. So we're the majority, but we weren't being heard. So I'm like, okay, that's not going to work. It's never going to work for us unless we do our own thing. So we started Chicano Hollywood, with the streaming platform. So, yes, it's a Chicano Netflix. And I did that. I remember when I first pitched the idea. Now this is this December, just eight months later, eight or nine months later, we're having a mixer, our first mixer. 
it came out amazing. I had no idea who was going to show up packed out and uh, I had all these people there and, and we had just bought the brand from Paul Rodriguez of Latin Kings comedy. We just got that brand. So we made a big announcement. We all now own that brand and so on. And, uh, we had this mixer and I had a TV set up with a uh, kind of like a facade of a streaming platform. And I said, guys, this is what we're doing now. And the reason we're doing this is so that when you are pitching to your investors, you could say, yes, I have a streaming platform that's going to take our content. And this will start giving us leverage with investors because they always want to know, what are you going to do? If I give you money, how am I going to get my money back? So let's start creating this ecosystem that we can generate the income that will attract the investors so we can make our content. And we don't need anyone else to green light us. We can green light ourselves. So that's how the streaming platform started. So right now, you know, any of your listeners want to go to their Roku or their uh, Apple, their iPhone, their Google, any of the app stores and just put in Chicano Hollywood. You can download our app, which I would love for you to do. And see the content. So right now we're, we've got a lot, bunch of licensed content up there from indie uh, filmmakers. And it's from documentaries, to movies, to uh, series. And we're creating more. You know, uh, as originals, we created a, a couple of music shows. One's called CHM, which is Chicano Hollywood Musica. And what that is, is kind of like a throwback to like MTV when they used to have just music videos. So we put Chicano artists with Chicano video jockeys. And we have a one hour show that's just old school MTV style. And we're doing more episodes. We'll be dropping some more. So that's where it came from. So we're, we're just, you know, we're, we're doing uh, training like this April 1st, we have a stunt training to train actors, how to work with stunt and film fighting and directors, how to film around it and so on. We have some other things coming up and we just did a mentorship last weekend with the short film where we got like 10 kids that wanted to be in the film industry and we put them on set. We taught them how to hold the boom. We tell them how the whole process works because I know that our voice will only get louder when there's more of us. So we're committed to training the next generation as well. So, you know, we have a whole set of master classes, which you can go to Chicano Hollywood masterclasses.com and look at our master classes and you can start learning from other uh, other Latinos and Chicanos that are in the game. And, and the people on there are like high level. You know, Patricia De Leon, who's a great actress, and Paul Anthony, where he does the makeup and the hair for like Jane Lowe and Rosalind Sanchez. There's some really high caliber people, right? And so, and they're all excited. Yeah, I don't know why I ask them, hey, are you down to do a master class? Like, oh my gosh, yes, we need to get more of us in there. So they're excited about it. So, so we have a lot of stuff going on because uh, we knew that if we don't do it for ourselves, no one's going to do it for us. I mean, it's great. Yeah. And I know that we always need to have that mindset that if the door is too small or we don't get a seat at the table, we need to either break down the door or just build it ourselves. And that's what I keep saying. And you've obviously done it. The Chicano Hollywood is a cultural, just Chicano in general is a cultural and political word and, you know, how it's used and it started back, and I think you and I are of the same genre here of where it originated back in the 60s and 70s due to the lack of resources and exploitation of workers, right? And I think that's very evident today in yeah. a lot of the industries, especially here in California, which is where the origination really came from. And it even stemmed, you know, further back, right? I mean, it's part of Texas as well, you know, the school movements back then. So there's a lot there of just the lack of resources. So in my mind, when I hear the Chicano Hollywood, it's almost in that way. I don't want to put words into what it is, but, you know, you talk of the cultural norm of your 80s experience. And when folks in Hollywood say, oh, they don't want to hear that voice or no, there's no room because it supposed to fit this narrative i'm with you on the uh, you know i beg to differ because if i can just say this encanto i know it's disney but it was colombian and they had a lot of latino consultants there uh to make sure that they hit it right but it was a broad voice that related to the culture of what you're describing which is music art and these are just another facet of our personality, and it really should be included. That's my personal take on it. I mean, it's a complete movement besides a culture, and there's even academia, you know, uh, Chicano studies that are in a lot of state schools. 
So, I mean, it's something that is powerful and also very culturally identifying as, you know, we stand strong and proud and we're going to make things happen with or without you. And I think that's the overall message I'm getting from you yeah. in um, the Chicano Hollywood, like, let's do it ourselves, which is yeah. the whole movement in itself of how it started. I don't know. That's just me. <laughs> no. I, well, you're right, though. I, you know, I tell people that we are in the in the beginning stages of a Chicano renaissance. Mm. So the term Chicano, go back even earlier, the 40s, 30s, 40s, uh -huh. 50s, it was a almost a derogatory term. It was almost like saying the N-word. Uh. And you know, it was an offensive word. But right around this late 50s, 60s, during the farm uh, workers move and so on, it became an empowering term. But it was still a politically motivated term, which, you know, which kind of segregated the Mexican descent people that were born here in the U.S., right? Uh -huh. So uh, well, American Mexicans, per se, we were, you know, we're born here, but we were, were from Mexican descent. My parents are from Mexico. I was born and raised in San Jose, right? Yeah. So now I look at us now with 40 million, to, so of course, it's probably more, but the uh -huh. census, 40 to 50 million of us that all have uh, common denominators from the things that you're talking about, uh -huh. music, you know, faith, Law riders, street tacos, all those things. Those are things within our community that we all kind of gravitate to. There's a big thing here, like, we need to change the narrative. You know, well, they keep writing us as cholos. Well, we all have a relative that's a cholo, whether it's a nephew <laughs> or a niece, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. And I'm like, you know, hey, it's still true, though, you know? And <laughs> I just did a bunch of filming in East L.A. And, like, there's still cholitos there, you know? And uh, they're still wearing Pendletons and... So it's still a real narrative within us. But as long as we are the ones telling the story, yeah, Hollywood is going to write it the way they see it. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I give this explanation all the time because I'm a writer too. So I know how I write. I write from based off my own experiences. So when you see a movie where they're showing the a Latina or a Chicana as a maid or, a, or someone as a gardener, my assumption is that that writer is a white writer and they're told, okay, we need a maid. And that white writer probably had a Latina nanny or Latina maid. So they say, oh yeah, her name is Carmen or her name is Maria, you know, or they said, we need some gardeners to come over and throw grass over the fence. Okay. Well, Manuel, because his gardener used to be Manuel, you know, so they're going to write from their own experiences or, or they, you know, we need gang members. Well, that poor white writer here in Hollywood probably got jumped by some cholos in East LA. So he's like, oh yeah, these are gang members. They were bandanas and they were they carry knives you know and so they're writing based off their experiences so what we have to do as a not just entertainment professionals but as a community is we have to rewrite our stories yeah so i think where we're at right now we're the beginning of the chicano renaissance and now it's our time to create art in our voice with our stories and our voice with our faces so as long as we control the narrative, then we need to tell it the way we see it and not be afraid. I love a good total story, especially if it's comedy. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen on your on your streaming platform there's a there's a couple of cholo comedies on there that is funny. I think yeah. that it's, it's very true. It's like six degrees of your family that may be a cholo or a chola, right? It's like that's mm -hmm. very apparent in my world too. Yeah. And, you know, you do yeah. make a good point about how they get uh, caught up in that life. And it's deflating to see that when they can't break the cycle and it's like, why should I break the cycle? Right. Why? And I think there are reasons for the culture being intact in that way. Yeah. I think it's very hard and it's really kind of what's been happening in our society. And I think it's just really empowering to know that they have a voice that they can stand behind and that people really want to see them succeed. You know, the world is so big, right? And one of the things I found fascinating, and this is actually something I wanted to chat with you a little bit, Japan, right? In Tokyo, there's a whole Chicano, like Cholo, Chola yeah. culture that's yeah. evolving over there. They're importing Chevys and Impalas and... Impalas, yeah, lowriders, yeah. But there's a whole thing, yeah. and I forget what media platform I saw it on. But I saw the video that they made about them. They were even getting the tattoos 
Yeah, right, that said yeah. La Loca on their chest, yeah. you know, just like yeah. getting tatted. And it's like, hey, they asked them, like, why are you doing that? And uh, they said, we think they're amazing, that the women are powerful and they are creative and they have this whole art style. And that is cultural appropriation. But the fact that they are looking at Chicanos and and the not the gang environment. It's just the culture itself yeah. and what it lends to, and they see it as creative art and empowering. And I think that's so yeah. how we the lens is not. Maybe they do look at yeah. it that way. Maybe they don't. I don't know. But honestly, I take it as a compliment. Yeah, because you know I I've heard other people talk about that like as cultural appropriation, but I like no, not to me. To me, it's a compliment because they see us and they want to be us, mm -hmm. and that's okay to me. Now, when you dig deeper, because I know some guys that they do upholstery for lowriders and so on. Uh, we did a video for for BuzzFeed the other day on this one homie that does the upholstery for lowriders, and I'm asking him and said, "So, who's your number one customer?" He goes, "Bro, I get orders from all over the world." They're hitting me up from all over the world, from Europe to Russia to Japan, where they want our lowrider style and culture. So to me, it's like them appropriating our culture is going to bring business to our small businesses. Man, go for it. Let's send them Pendleton's. Let's send them. I don't know who owns Pendleton, but you know, let's, yeah. let's send them. <laughs> uh, Summer Hats has a Danny De La Paz brim and there's a Freddie the Grady brim. Let's send those. I know the the Ortega brothers, they oversee all that. So let's send them that because I think it's I think it's a compliment. And it's good for us as a sense because it shows our influence, you know. And there's no way that a group as powerful as us, as creative as us, to not have an international influence. Now, uh, let me go back further. Even last November, Elvira, she's a wardrobe fashion designer and so on. And she would do wardrobe for some of my projects. She hits me up and she says, Hey, I want to do a fashion show. We need to, in her words, we need to show ourselves at a higher level where we don't always look so ratchet. Right. And I'm like, okay, what do you want to do? She goes, let me put, let's put a fashion show together. I'm like, right, I'm done with it. Let's do it. So we put together Chicano elegance and neither one of us knew what it was going to be like. We're like, let's just try. So we're marketing, we're pushing this, get your tickets, you know, and when the night came, it was freaking amazing. We had seven designers show their stuff. We had uh, uh, 200 people plus everyone. We had like 300 people there. Very elegant. We had wineries come from Napa Valley, Latino wineries come, and we had others from the local area. And it was it was a very high level, elegant event. Mm -hmm. Social media, you know, blew up. Everyone's taking pictures and, you know, hashtagging and so on. The next day, Alvira got emails from Paris, London, I think Dubai, Sydney, and Milan. But those main fashion hubs, she's getting emails saying, we love your show. Please bring your show to our city. And you come as a, as a guest. We have tickets for you to come and so on. So the doors open wide open all over the world. And I, and I told her, I said, man, Alvira, you put the Chicano community and the world stage of the fashion world, or you know, internationally. I said, look at where we're at now. So one of her specialties is the 90s look, right? Yeah. So they're going to see her designs and they're going to start dressing like, you know, like we did in the house party times of the 90s, like party crew times. <laughs> There's one Latina that's up there already. Her name is Joanna Hernandez. She has the Glaudi brand and she's, she's a good friend of mine. And so she's already out there. And so she's showing the world quinceanera dresses and wedding dresses, you know, her style. She's from El Salvador. She was raised in Downey and Compton. So she's a Chicana like us. You know? yeah. So she, we honored her that night. So, you know, like I said, this renaissance is happening. It's something that we need to embrace and just empower each other with and motivate each other with, because I, I really see that our, our voice is going to really hit international levels not just in fashion, movie, and film, but, you know, art as well. Just regular, you know, we're, we're excellent at doing murals and in artwork. And I got a call from uh, a friend that's in San Jose, and he's about to open up what's going to be the largest art gallery, largest Latino art gallery in the nation. And his clients are already going to, like, New York and Miami and different other shows. And so he's expanding 
He has one there now in San Jose downtown, and he's about to expand even more. So he will be the largest gallery. This is a Chicano, and he represents Chicano artists plus other artists as well. So we're going to link up and start Chicano Hollywood Art. It's another vertical, and it's going to put us all over the world as well. Yeah. So to me, I'm like, we're there. So as far as cultural appropriation, man, it's good for business. We want them to buy our stuff. <laughs> we want them to import our low riders. We want them because we're the one that make them. So I'm like, man, let's go for it. Take it all, you know? So I think it's a good time for it. Yeah. I want to say yes. And some people would say, well, we're not for sale, right? Like it's not for sale. But again, this is entrepreneurial spirit and how we show up and be business owners. This is kind of the way and not to put it in Mandalorian terms, this is the way. But, you know. <laughs> I love that show. I do, too. Anyway, I, yeah, I digress yeah. into the Mandalorian. But what I'm saying uh -huh. is we do <laughs> have these attributes of entrepreneurial spirit. And a lot of people would say, well, how do we grow that business? Or how do we get there into, like you, like making it a platform? And you were right at the beginning. We have to continue as an ecosystem to leverage each other and to really build the community, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, having ownership in the community and I like to say taking back the block, right? How you do that, Nipsey Hussle was starting that. A lot of folks mm -hmm. are saying, let's reinvest in our community and make it better. And also that takes a partnership with city council and you are becoming integrated into policy, which is very good. If I can just say one thing about Unesis in Los Angeles, who ran for her district, and a lot of folks didn't think because she's a Latina, she came from, you know, a barrio neighborhood that she would ever win as a representative of government. And she did. And she uh, stands for all of these things that the comunidad against gentrification of the neighborhood so that the elders can stay in their homes. You know, how do uh, we reinvest in the community and make policies that are suitable to us? So, I mean, this is a way to leverage that because they want the business to succeed and they want the tax dollars. It's just how you work within that and lean into it a little of the discomfortness. But at the end of the day, they want it to work. And it's like if the community comes together, then it will work, right? And I think you're providing yeah. a wonderful platform to show that, giving uh, skills in the film industry, how people can leverage their talent instead of seeing the narrative being provided by other folks in the industry. I mean, it goes across the board, John, and I've said this a few times at Google that narrative still plays there. When I was there, I was one of the few Latinas. And every time I went to the bathroom, who do you think was cleaning the bathroom? Mm -hmm. Latinas and Latinos. Who do you think the gardeners were at the entire mm -hmm. campus over there? Latinos. And I'm like, hey, this is not the narrative here. It's like, I've seen white gardeners. Why aren't mm -hmm. they clean, you know, here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I've seen those folks, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and and in the kitchens, too, because they have those giant, amazing cafeterias. It's like, that is where the narrative of, like, we're always seen in these low-wage jobs, and this is an opportunity to change the pathway Yeah. with the platform. So that's my little spiel there. No, I like it. I was having this conversation yesterday with great actor Rocco Vargas and Chicano actor and combat veteran. He was special forces for years and then he just gets into acting. He gets to the top. He just, you know, he's a writer now for uh, my ends and so on. Beautiful man, just great guy. And he's one of those guys that no matter what he does, he goes to the top, you know? So him and I were talking about how the streaming platform that we have, the opportunity that we have to really preserve our culture. And that's by creating content. We can create sitcoms that preserve our culture. We create dramas, not just documentaries that are documenting our life and history, so on, but we can actually shape our culture so that we're preserving it. And I, I, I want to do it so that our next generations are proud of their heritage. You know, and there's no doubt as life happens and we are a melting pot. So our kids are going to potentially 
intermarry with other ethnicities and there my grandkids will probably intermarry. It's just the way it goes. So there's got to be some kind of a archive that we can always show what the Chicano voice is. Even now with immigration still coming across, we have the children of those immigrants. They're going to grow up American. And it's just the way life is when you migrate and so on. But being able to have a place that we can put the stories up of our culture, of our history. I've got superhero ideas that we're working with and content that we're building. I'm always down for good chorro comedy, but I also want to create entrepreneur level type of stories where we do create a series that has a Chicano president or Chicano congressman or Chicano CEOs. We have to influence our children and with our story so that they can see, oh, that guy is like a Chicano like me or a Latino like me. And he's playing the role of the president. So that means, yes, I can do that one day too. That's, that's how we shape it. If we always show gang member Biden animals, then our kids think, oh, I want to be like that. You see it in music videos all the time where they show these guys with guns and cool and they look cool and the music gets in their head. And it actually influences their, the ideology of our, how they want to you know, grow up and be like, you know, that was one of the problems of my little brother. He wanted to grow up, be a gang member. And he uh. did, and he did some bad things and did 23 years in prison. So we need to change it. I remember that's why I wasn't a good total. I wanted Mike Brady to be my dad because, and I wanted Greg and Peter and Bobby to be my brothers, you know, so. It was a whole different yeah. ball game, but I still have my lowrider. You know, I still, I still have, yeah. to, my, my, I still have to do my gang banging too. But, but it's just how TV, movies, content influences. So we have now created a foundation that we can influence our future of our community. Yeah. And that's the responsibility that I have. And, you know, even going into the businesses, our ecosystem, right before we got on this podcast, I sent out like a, just a ton of emails to small businesses saying, look, this is what we can offer you. Let's get some of your marketing going. I'm telling you, you could put your products in the stuff that we're developing. They can never do it like Hollywood is doing it because they'll charge them an arm and a leg. They'll never be able to afford it. You put a can of Pepsi in Brad Pitt's hand in World War Z, you know, that's going to cost millions of dollars, but you can get your product and put it in our content and it's not going to cost that much, you know, because we're the gatekeepers. We can do it ourselves. I really want to help small businesses and, you know, leverage our relationship so that we can get that buying power going within our community. You know, we have a 1.8 trillion buying power within the Latino community. Some people say 2.1. It's more. It's actually more. What is it? What's the number? I keep. It's close to three. And our population across from the 2020 census is close to 60 million. It's like 18.7% of the total population in the United States. And I always like to say we're our own key makers yep. to folks and we have to help each other in this new renaissance and also to understand the history, right? And also understand how big our culture is and the influence it has. Like you said, it's just, yep. I just saw John Leguizamo in, at South by Southwest. He has a new series coming out this coming month in April and he said he still has to pitch really hard. Yeah. And he said that executives in Hollywood said, John, Latinos don't want to see happy Latinos or historical pieces. This is what he said when he goes there to pitch them. And he has a direct channel to these bigger executives with, you know, millions of dollars. And he's just sitting there scratching his head going, what do you mean? And he's like, well, look, they all want to see gangster movies and gangster TV shows, and that's just what they want. And then you flip the script saying, are you trying to tell us that Encanto, it was gangster? Like, yeah. I don't understand. Like, that beat Frozen, and uh, what are you talking about? Like, we don't have any heroes in our community? Like, there's so many, and nobody wants to see a period piece. This was exactly what he said, like, there was a Latino that helped, uh, I think it was like 40,000 Jews escape from, yeah. you know, Europe. Yeah. There's not a story about that, but there's Schindler's List. Yeah. So I don't know. You're telling me nobody likes period pieces? Of yeah. history. It's like, yeah. What? And, he, and then and then he said, I could not believe this. And I am quoting verbatim here. They said, 
Well, John, that's okay because we have their money anyway. Yeah. So you don't need to like, and this is where you're changing that. He's doing it. I think at some point you guys are all going to collide together and boom, all this magic is going to happen. But I was shocked to hear him say that how hard he still has to pitch yeah. for these things. And it's not just Mexicans and Latinos and everything. He just mentioned that he doesn't see us as one checkbox. He knows, you know, we have all these different, like you said, Tejano and Puerto Ricans and, you know, Latinos in, in Southern California and Chicago, but we're all bound together by this narrative, right, that is so profound. And why is it missing? That's like the big question, right? Like, Yeah. And that's why I'm very, very open about this to say, look, I don't compete with other Latinos. So John Leguizamos, he's the owner of Me Too, which is a company here and based here in LA. I used to freelance for them a lot. I've done a couple of series for them and so on. So it's a good company. I love them and just really would benefit from the great company they have there. So he owns that one now. He just purchased it, I think, like last year. Yeah. And GL, yeah, yeah. So they partner, they they picked them up. And so, you know, on, we still, one of my business partners still freelances for them and so on. So, and even there's another one called Better Like. I still freelance for them too. So I don't compete with other Latinos. And I really try to make that clear. Now, people ask me, well, why don't you take to Latino Hollywood? Because it's Chicano Hollywood. The, the, the name evolved from a bunch of Chicanos. I had one guy smoking a joint. So, uh, so, but I, I'm, I'm a Chicano and I'm going to put our voice out there. But if we don't compete with other Latinos, we want to lock arms with them. Our content, I mean, to me, like, especially like our music stuff. It's all Latino stuff, and we're going to build our whole community because we have our history is connected to Spain colonization. Mm -hmm. Some people like it, some people don't, but it is what it is. It's history. We have the common language of Spanish, and that's what we have. And then we have a lot of food similarities and a lot of other. We love music and there's art. And so we're, we're bound together by those values. And my ultimate goal is to build our Chicano community and our voice up so strong, I can't even begin to think I'm going to control it all. So the idea of someone duplicating, all that means is more work for our content creators, more work for our writers, more work for our actors, more work for our producers. So yeah, you know what? Let them, let them. And I can't wait to see the a Chicano genre on Netflix or Chicano genre on Hulu or or Amazon or Apple or Warner Brothers or any of these guys that say, okay, this is where we got to go. I'm always down for a partnership and so on. But I know eventually when our voice gets so loud and we're taking their ad dollars and we're taking their investment dollars and we're and then and we're owning it, that's when they're going to have to come with respect, tap on the door and say, okay, how do we work together? Because we know we've controlled your money all this time, but you figured it out. You figured it out. I had one of my consultants when I started building big player, one of the big studios. If I said the name, you bet, oh my gosh. He told me, he goes, Johnny, you figured it out. He goes, you figured something out that us white people don't have it figured out yet. He goes, you know your people and you know your Chicano voice. He says, us white people, all we think is all you guys want Spanish and you just want to watch Univision or Telemundo. For as far as we're concerned, that's what you're going to do. We're not going to mess with it. That you figured out the English speaking Mexican American voice. I say, yes. He goes, okay, then I'm behind you. So he's a consultant of mine and he's always there to help, but he's like a big player. And he's like, uh, you let me know when you're ready and I'm, I'll help you open any doors you want. So we're building, you know, this, we're building as we're going, but I know that we're getting their attention, which I'm fine. I just want the respect, you know, I just want them to respect our, our filmmakers. I want them to, to green light our content and our ideas. And until they're ready to do it, we're going to do it ourselves. And exactly. uh, I'm, I'm not in a hurry to, to pass anything on. I am in a hurry to build our pull up. So that's right. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And so in this new digital format, right, that we're trying to get a lot of our voices out and create work. Actually, what we're saying at the end of the day is we're trying to create more jobs and opportunities that a lot of folks in this space are not having access to because of probably the way they look and they want to, you know, pursue a passion that they feel that there's such limited opportunities. 
It's the same in tech. I say this all the time. You know, the door is so small. And when you see like, how am I going to get there? I don't have a degree or I look a certain way. I don't have any skills. The internet is open to everybody. And so now they can find you if they are passionate about film and media and music and they create something, they can reach out to you at ChicanoHollywood.com. You could have a conversation and see where they can work with you. Or if you're looking for a job, the most that I see now, and these are more conversations we're going to have on this platform, is people in the community. You talked about how they're incarcerated and they come out after they've served time. Some of them are there for bullshit things, right? Very minimal things and some very bad things. But when they come out, it's so it's such a slippery slope, right? They get their souls saved, but then, you know, the skills and the record stays with them and that's hanging. And where do they go? They need jobs. There's a lot of nonprofits like uh, I know Homeboy in- Industries down in L.A. Yeah, that's very good. Tries to give folks opportunities and jobs. Right. And you're doing the same thing. You're doing the same thing in a different arena. And I think that's awesome. And more of these to help the community find purpose, right? It's finding purpose. And a lot of us sometimes feel like very beaten down in our psyche about that, especially post-COVID. It's been really super hard. And I, I think this is awesome what you're doing, Johnny. And I really love that. That's exactly our mission is to empower people, give them tools. And that's taking what they've been through, putting a tool in their hand, and now they'll be able to make make a living off of it. So that's what we're doing. So it's really fun. That's awesome. You got to get Cheech Marin out in that circle. I mean, he's out there in uh, Orange County with his art museum. And he's doing preserving Chicano art. You know, Um, he's got the big collection. So that's also an opportunity to, I think, tap into. I mean, the comedy and the art right there. I mean, it's all together. But, well, John, this has been awesome. Thank you for joining us today. So where can we find you? Yes, please. If you have an idea, you want to contact us, maybe have some a short film or documentary, we'd love to get that information from you. Maybe put it on our streaming platform. You can email us at info at com. Super easy. Follow us on social media, IG, Facebook, and TikTok at Chicano Hollywood. It's the same all the way across. And yeah, get a hold of us. You know, if you have content or let's say if you're a brand and you want to be a part of our ecosystem, you want to support what we're doing, you know, we're, I know we're disrupting and I'm excited about it because we're going to disrupt enough to get the respect that we deserve. We were here first. There's no reason we should be last. Awesome. So, Partner with us. Let's build this up. Let's create content. Let's create stories, our stories and our voice with our faces. That's what we want to do. Yep. We're key makers in our community. So that's that's wonderful. Well, thank you, Johnny, for joining me today. And uh, anytime, you know, we can pick up the conversation on your next fashion show or big premiere. Give us a holla. Yes. (laughs) No, we're partners in this. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Johnny, for joining me today on Latinas from the block to the boardroom. You know, we can connect with Johnny and Chicano Hollywood through IG, which is Chicano Hollywood. That's C-H-I-C-A-N-O Hollywood. And you can go to their website, which is ChicanoHollywood.com. And you can look for the Chicano Hollywood streaming platform, which is their TV, music, and also you can sign up for their master classes, as Johnny had mentioned. They're also going to be hosting an Elevate conference here in September, which is coming up, that will showcase a lot of Latino and Chicano actors and speakers and influencers. So if you'd like to connect with the community and learn more about what Chicano Hollywood is doing, please go to their website to learn more about the Elevate conference there in Los Angeles, September 8th and 9th. Again, thank you, Johnny, for joining me today on Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom. This podcast was produced and sponsored by 5E Leadership and Latinas B2B.Marketing. 
If you'd like more information about podcasting and also how you can elevate your small business through our publication or podcast, you can reach out to us at info, that's I-N-F-O, at latinasb2b.com. This podcast was audio engineered and sound designed by Robert Lopez of Crate Audio. Gracias.